Gospels tonight to uh, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, and we'll go straight to chapter 1. Marathon study through the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. I, for one, have greatly enjoyed it. Apparently, I'm the only one, not even a single amen out of that. Oh, was there? Okay, I didn't hear that. I thought, this is a really in-depth study of the Holy Spirit. Okay. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now, last time, again, just to back up just that little bit and help us to get back on course again. Uh, we, we went through, we're, we're just talking dispensationally about how the Spirit of God is working from the Old Testament to New Testament. We're in the, uh, what is specifically mentioned in the time of the church age. Uh, we talked last week, I showed you that he enables us to speak correctly about the Lord Jesus Christ. I have an interesting story about that if you want to hear it afterward. I won't say it online uh, just in case, but very interesting after last week's lesson what took place. And then the second thing we looked at last week was having communion, that the Holy Spirit has communion with us, fellowship with us, and Paul prayed that we would have that communion. And then uh, we finished up by looking at, um, uh, in that communion, sorry, we were just looking at the communion of the Holy Ghost and that that allows us to have the fellowship of the Spirit between us. When, When we're all in communion with the Spirit of God individually, we have communion with one another and fellowship with one another, and that's what makes that fellowship to be sweet and, and appropriate and proper as it should be. All right, so this week uh, we're going to pick it up here in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, and I want to look at verses 5 to 7. And here the scriptures say, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So it's briefly there, he's just talking about the fact that they brought the gospel to him, preached the gospel to him, and they did it in those three things, in assurance, in much assurance, uh, in the Holy Ghost, and in power. All right, so they, they preached the gospel to them. We're going to go look at that in a minute, but look at verse number six. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. All right, so here's the next thing I want us to look at that the Spirit of God does in this day that we live is that He gives joy in following after those that minister the Word of God to us. He gives joy in following after those that minister the Word of God to us. And of course, uh, <clears throat> following after them and the Lord, if you want to have that as the, the parenthetical thought. And I don't think it's less important. I'm just simply saying that there is a joy given to follow those that minister the Word. Now, let's look at a couple things here. When he said there that the gospel that was preached to them uh, was preached in the power of the Holy Ghost, and, or excuse me, in the Holy Ghost and in power and much assurance. He's referring specifically to the event of when he brought the gospel to them. So let's go look at that real quickly in Acts chapter number 17. And there's an important point to be made here, so I, I'm, I'm drawing this back here for a good reason. So there's Paul and Silas, and they're on their way now. They've They've had their beating there in Philippi, and they've, uh, now they're on their way. They're going to continue to preach the gospel. Verse number 1, Now when they had passed through Amp- Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed. All right. Now, when we look over at 1 Thessalonians, clearly this is some of those people. Uh, Some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, 
and of the chief women, not a few. All right, so you got your core group of believers. The first time the gospel's come to them, they've believed on Jesus Christ, and now you have, you have th this forming of this church. Now watch. But the Jews which believed not. So some in this synagogue, there were some that believed and some who said they didn't want to have a bar of it. And they believed not. What did they do? They moved with envy. They are envious at the rapid conversion of someone from Judaism, their lifelong religion, to come over to Jesus Christ in three Sabbath days. This wasn't a, a long thing that took place. This is only three weeks. And these people, after hearing the scriptures preached for three weeks, said, we believe what Paul says. We believe Jesus is the Christ. And they're converted to him. And, and so you have this group of people who's now drawing out of the synagogue, drawing away from Judaism. And those Jews who didn't believe, they're upset. We see this happen in our own society today with other religions too. You see people get saved and and the next thing you know is their family's cutting them off, their friends are cutting them off, the religious leaders of their churches are cutting, or of their groups are cutting them off, are, are angry, they're upset, they're moved with envy that they're not able to keep those people in their grasp. And so they took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. I love that every time I read it. That is the most descriptive way of talking about some real mugs. I mean, these are some really bad, bad dudes. <laughs> they are lewd fellows of the baser sort. And they gathered a company, and they set all the city on an uproar. Think about that. They're so envious at the conversion that Paul had of people getting saved, they stirred the entire city up. And not just stirred up like, yeah, well, we just don't think that's right. It's an uproar. Uh, they've got sticks in hands and stones in hand, and, and they're ready for a fight. And so what do they do? They assaulted, verse number 5 there, they assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So at this point, they're ready to flog them again. Or, or they would have, it would have been again for Paul and Silas, but for the first time for these believers. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. No, they don't. They made that up. They're lying about him to try to stir up trouble. They weren't, they weren't contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Now, they weren't going to give incense to Caesar, but that's not what they're talking about here. They're talking about the laws and rules of, of the kingdom. They're not doing anything of the sort, so they're lying about them now and uh, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security, that he's out on bond, on bail, and... Of the other, they let them go. All right, that's the beginning of these Christians. Now, <clears throat> some of you might have been through this in your Christian walk. I don't know. I know I wasn't. Uh, when I got saved, there was a lot of people that rejoiced. But nobody lied about me. Nobody tried to find me so that they could beat me. And nobody was trying to get a whole city to come after me. And so I don't know how your conversion was. But from the beginning of these people trusting Christ... They had an entire city ready to, to do away with them. Now, you, you know, I, I, a persecution is going to do one of two things. It's either going to get you rock solid and set, and you're going to continue on, or it's going to filter you out. And it, it looks to me like from what Paul's writing here in 1 Thessalonians, that these people just said, we're going nowhere. We've trusted Christ. We've seen the proof of it. We know who He is, and we're going nowhere. We put our faith in Him. We're going to trust Him. Now, <clears throat> that right there, you're, you're talking being saved for, for days, for all this to happen, days. And they have more resolve than a lot of Christians have today that have been saved for years. Amen. These people had set in their heart, we've trusted Christ, we're not moving off of that. And so when we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and he says that you received it in much affliction, He's talking about instantly family, friends, government, legal authorities, 
everyone was against them, and yet they just stuck with it. Our gospel, he said in verse 5, came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. They had a good testimony, and you became followers of us and of the Lord. They decided to follow Paul because Paul was preaching Christ. And they did that even in much affliction. He says in verse 6, having received the word in much affliction. Now the reason I say that this is important here is this. Because they not only got saved under that affliction, but they stayed with it under that affliction. And they didn't do it with the frowns and and uh, moping and complaining and whinging and carrying on about how hard the Christian life was. Look at verse 6. With joy of the Holy Ghost. Now you and I both know if, if we start a journey and from the from day dot it's affliction and trials and hardships most of us aren't going to be walking around with a smile on our face when we go through that even in just the common things in life we start getting a bit frowny about it these people had joy you remember what Nehemiah said the joy of the Lord is your strength and these people had joy but it's a supernatural joy this isn't this you know, as the old saying is, picking yourself up by the bootstraps. That's not what this is. This isn't the power of positive thinking. This is the supernatural work of the Spirit of God in the life of these people who not only gave them the joy to receive the gospel message, but gave them joy to continue in the gospel message and in the faith. And they followed Christ and they followed the Apostle Paul with joy. Now, Again, I just want you to, to paint this as the real picture that it is. How about we just get saved, but we don't follow Paul, because everywhere Paul goes, there's trouble. But that's not what they did. They were happy to be identified with the group that the Apostle Paul was preaching. And that's how it would have been identified from the secular scene. And this is Paul's group. We know it's Christ. But they're happy to be identified with that. Surely by, in a short period of time, they would have known about the beating that they had in Philippi. Surely they would know about the shipwrecking, the, the constant being run out of town, the constant uproar of the Jews against the message of Christ. It doesn't take very long for someone to say, I don't think I want to be a part of that, I'll be a secret Christian. But because of the power of the Spirit of God, they said, we're going on and we're going to follow Paul, we're going to follow the Lord, and we're going to do it with joy. And guys, I'm telling you that this is another one of those read between the line bits, but that brings great joy to the Apostle Paul to know that those people were willing to just continue on in spite of all of the affliction, all of the trouble. And the Holy Ghost will give you joy to follow after those who are preaching the Word of God to you if you'll just follow because they're following the Lord. Now, you know, we understand and it should kind of go without saying if whoever's teaching the Word of God to you isn't following the Lord anymore, there's no obligation to that. You just keep following the Lord. We're not looking for people to be faithful to the pastor in the sense that, you know, faithful to a fault. That's not at all what we're talking about here. We're just talking about those that are faithful to the Word of God. They're trying to lead, and they're following Christ. And the Holy Ghost will give you the joy to follow after that, if you'll let Him. Because He's sensitive, and He can be resisted, and He can be grieved. He can be quenched. But if we'll walk in the Spirit of God, no matter whether, you know, I'm the one in the pulpit, maybe it's easy for me to say it because I'm that person, but I've also sat in the pew, and I've sat in the pew in some difficult situations. But when I set my eyes on the Lord, and I wanted to follow the people that were helping me follow Christ, I just had joy. And it came because of the work of the Spirit of God in me. And it will be that way for you too. I want you to keep your finger there and look over here at Philippians. And, you know, this ties in very closely, Philippians chapter 2, very closely to what Brother Harrington preached when he was here just a couple weeks ago, or a week and a bit ago. 
about uh, persecution and the spread of the gospel. Look at this. Philippians chapter 2 and uh, verse number 27. Only uh, let your conversation be, this is your life, let it be as becometh. That's a fitting, something that's becoming for those who don't understand that word. If it's becoming to you, I'm in chapter 1, sorry. Chapter 1, I wrote it down wrong, but I just realized that I was looking at the number the number right below it. Chapter 1, verse number 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel. It's fitting, it's dressing, it's appropriate for the gospel. Do you not agree that the gospel message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ should be ordained with beauty, with joy, with contentment? He saved us from our sins, and He's delivered us from hell, and He's guaranteed us a home in heaven, and He has told us that he counts us brethren, we are saved and secure for eternity. That by itself ought to cause the gospel to be adorned with beauty in our lives, the way we live our lives. There's nothing that can possibly come into my life that should be able to rob that from me. I say that it should be that way, I just, because I know, I know us and I know our flesh. But he said, only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of our, your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them, if you're not afraid of them, to them, this is an evident token of your perdition, of the fact that you're lost. Uh, clearly, you're just crazy if you don't get afraid of the powers that be. But unto you, uh, but, but to you, it's evidence of salvation and that of God. Uh, I don't have to be afraid of what the powers that be are threatening. The people in Thessalonica didn't have to be afraid of the government and the, the, uh, the uh, legal authorities being against them because while to them it would have looked like these people are nuts, to those that were saved it was, no, this is our salvation. This is the, this is the evidence of of the deliverance that we've had through Jesus Christ, that the things of the world don't upset us anymore. They don't rob us of our joy. They don't rob us of our ability to walk after Christ with contentment. You, you understand? And so he said, verse 29, For unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ. I love this verse. Not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. You get it? It's given to you. It's given to you to be saved on behalf of Christ. It's given to you to believe on Him. And by the way, an extra gift is to suffer. That's a gift. No, 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 I don't want to suffer. I don't want to suffer for Christ. You know, I just want, because I've, I've grown up in Western society in the 20th and 21st century, and I like my air conditioning, I like my comfortable home, and I like my comfortable car, my comfortable shoes, my comfortable clothes. I like life just cruising right along where everybody thinks that Christianity is wonderful, and if they don't, they just leave us alone. I just want everything to be that way. We live in a bubble in a very brief period of human history where it's been okay to be what we are without persecution. And that's coming to an end. And when we think about that in Western culture, like we, we think about, well, that's, you know, that's how we know that, we, that, that the Lord's coming back you know, today. And I, you understand, I believe that He's coming back at any time, but He must be coming back now because there's no way God would expect me to have to suffer for Christ. No, that's a gift. That you would have to take one, we, we just put it figuratively, to have to take one on the nose for the Lord Jesus. To suffer for Him. And God said, I've gifted that to you. <clears throat> when those Thessalonican believers were under persecution from the very beginning, how was it that they could just continue on and that that could be uh, uh, just a, a mark of their blessing and become an example to others because they allowed the power of the Spirit of God to work in them and they counted it joy to suffer for Christ. That's, it, was, it was in them. And, and, you know, again, I say this, I'm trying to be as gentle as I can, but we're just spoiled. We're just spoiled. 
and we think that if we have to suffer for Christ, that, you know, the world's coming to the end. But he said, verse 30, having the same con conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. All right, so just coming back to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, he said in verse 6, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were in samples. And that's how I want to finish that, that singular point there because they allowed the joy of the Holy Spirit to rule in their hearts, they became an example of following those who preached the Word of God to them, following the Lord. They became an example to those in Macedonia and Achaia. When we let the Spirit of God give us joy to follow after, even if it means affliction. I didn't give you the definition of affliction. I should have. Uh, affliction. Troubling in the mind or the body. So they were physically beaten. They were mentally tormented. That's affliction. When we do that, when we, allow, when we say we're going to follow after the Word of God being preached to us by those that minister the Word of God to us, it brings joy. We've already looked at this. It brings joy to those that teach it but it will become an example to other people who may be coming after us. And that's a work of the Spirit of God because as we sit here tonight or at home, there's not one of us who says, yeah, that sounds wonderful to me. Sure, I want to believe something that's going to cause me affliction. We're trying to avoid that. But by the power of the Spirit of God, it's a very different story. Okay? So that's one of the, I think that's a wonderful work of the Spirit of God in the age that we live in that we can follow after those who teach the Word of God to us with joy through the Holy Ghost or in the Holy Ghost. All right, let's cover another point tonight at least. Um, let's go over to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Second Timothy chapter number one. All right, verses 13 and 14. He says, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing is an interesting phrase, but that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. All right, the next thing that I see the Spirit of God doing in our age is that He is helping us to keep the sound doctrine that has been taught to us. Now, <clears throat> if you read any of the commentators, you get about as many opinions as there are commentators. I want you to see something. If you flick over here to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 20, Paul says this to Timothy, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Right there, So there's, there's a similarity here. Avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. So I say here it's the, it's, it's the matter of doctrine. It's the matter of sound doctrine. If we just go backward a little bit here, uh, you'll find that uh, as Paul's writing in 2 Timothy 1, he's, he's exhorting Timothy, of course, um, talking verse 7, for instance, that God's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Um, he talks there about the Lord Jesus and, and the power of the gospel, verses 8 and 9. Uh, verse 10, it, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. This is the gospel message of salvation. Verse 11, whereunto I am appointed, and this is why I hold this position, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and, a, a, and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Now when you look at verse 11 and he says whereunto, that's like a therefore word. You have to look backward and say what is he talking about? And it's found in verse 10. 
but, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed. All right, so the gospel message is this thing that, was, that Paul was appointed to, to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Verse 12, for the which cause, also talking about the gospel, I also suffer these things. Okay, so we don't have to do very much of a study in the life of Paul to know that that's the case. He suffered because of the preaching of the gospel. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words. What are the sound words? Well, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel message. And that's the form of sound words. And sometimes you might preach it a little bit differently. Uh, and we, again, just do a, a casual study and reading through the book of Acts. And you'll see that, that Paul's message of the death, burial, and resurrection fundamentally never changed, but the presentation of it did. Sometimes he might say, you know, there's, there's a great need for repentance because Christ died, but then he's going to emphasize the resurrection, which is what he did most of the time. He emphasized the resurrection. But depending on his audience, if he was, he was talking to a group of Jews, he was nailing them with their disobedience to the law. If he's talking to the Gentiles, he was nailing them on their immoral life. You understand? And so he was telling, bringing everybody to the place where they needed to understand and receive the gospel message. And so he said, Hold fast the form of sound words, verse 13, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. He's taught them the gospel message. Then he's gone on to teach them. We say disciple. He's taught them how to walk in obedience to the Bible, to the word of God, sound doctrine. And so he says in verse number 14, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. The good thing is, first and foremost, the gospel message. Don't let the gospel message go. Don't minimize it. Don't try to change it to become more palatable. Keep it. And on top of that, keep sound doctrine that comes with it. You've got people who, through your life, will teach you sound doctrine from the Bible. Things that you can, you don't have to say, well, you know, I don't understand it, but I guess I'll just accept it. Something that you can look at, you can say, that's clearly what the Bible teaches. This is what I accept. This is sound doctrine. Keep that. And how do we keep it? Through the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. I, I hope that you're following my line of thinking here tonight. The Spirit of God is what enables us to keep that, <clears throat> which means that I'm not going to keep the gospel and sound doctrine by my own willpower or by my own rationale and reasoning. I'm going to have to keep it by the power of the Spirit of God. For one, there's many spirits in the world, and those spirits are constantly attacking the truth, and it's very easy to get drawn off course. And that, We've got plenty of verses that teach that. In the same book, chapter 3, this know also. Then in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And he goes through this long list of things. And what is he saying? These people didn't keep sound doctrine. They didn't pay attention to the, what the Bible was, to, the Bible that was taught to them. They didn't allow the Spirit of God to guard their hearts in the matter of, of sound doctrine. And so we, again, just, you know, we can expand the study out further and further. But let's just try to rein this back in. The Spirit of God's work in this day, especially the time that we're living in, is to keep sound doctrine. And He helps us to do that. We are not going to do that independent of Him. Do you see that? Do you understand? I hope we do understand that tonight. Okay. In addition to that, He's giving us a ministry wherewith we can teach it and preach it. And that's why I coupled chapter 6 and verse 20 of 1 Timothy. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. He had had the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. He had been commissioned by Paul. He had gone to a place to preach the gospel, to teach the word of God. He'd been given a sacred trust. And he said, keep it. Keep it. 
And whatever you do, preach the word. Do not get sidetracked with profane. Verse 20 again, chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. Don't get sidetracked with profane and vain babblings. You say, what does that mean? Conspiracy theories. That's for today, okay? <clears throat> I, I'm going to say something that could easily get me in trouble here because we're live and it's posted online, okay? I grew up in a church that was obsessed with conspiracies. And it did not do me one ounce of good as a Christian. It turned me into a rebel. And it turned the rest of the men in the church into a rebel as well. And we knew everything that was going on. We knew all of the dark dealings of the, of the dark underground and the underworld and all that stuff. We read all these books. I'm not even saying it wasn't true. But it didn't help me grow. And it didn't help me live for Christ. It just turned me into a rebel. So I hated government. What does the Bible say about that? It says that's wicked. It turned me against everything that ruled over me and made me think everyone's out to get me. And so I'm going to have to stand on my own and protect my own. And guys, I'm telling you, we were crazy. Uh, one of our guys built a house, lined the whole house in sheet metal so the government couldn't spy on him in his house. Certifiable nuts, man. Yeah, you needed a you needed a cone cap. So if you want to know, if you want a good application of not getting sidetracked with profane and vain babblings, there's one. Okay, there's one. And he said, don't also get sidetracked with oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. You guys okay? All right. I coupled those together, as I said, because Paul was telling Timothy, you've been given a sacred trust. That sacred trust is the Word of God and the Gospel and a ministry to carry it out. So stick with it. And make sure that your ministry is consumed with sound doctrine. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is through the power of the Spirit of God. Because we are driven in every direction that we don't need to be driven by our own flesh, the world, you know, the devil at all, okay? All right, you guys are very quiet tonight. Maybe I'll start getting some text messages. I'll check my phone afterward and see who's texting me. All right. <laughs> um, I'm going to cover one more point. One more point. We've already talked about prayer, so we're changing gears again, all right? This is third gear now. Uh, we've already talked about prayer, but there's a couple of things that I didn't bring in. Can you go over to uh, Romans chapter 8? This is the work of the Spirit of God in this age, in the church, in believers. Romans chapter 8. Now before when we <clears throat> brought this in, we were talking about how the Spirit of God assists us in prayer, Ephesians 6.18. But I want to bring this in too as just a reminder that we all know, I'm sure, that thank God the Holy Spirit prays for us. He prays for us. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what to pray for, what we should pray for, excuse me, as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He goes on, says in verse 27, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. That's just such a great and blessed promise that we have there. It's a truth that when you're struggling, when you're hurting, when you're failing in your Christian life, 
you have not only the Lord Jesus, by the way, according to the book of Hebrews, but you have the Spirit of God praying for you. And He prays for you when you don't know what to pray for. Sometimes what we pray for isn't right. And I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit, that the Father, ignores my bad prayer and gives ear to the prayer of the Spirit of God. And that what He prays is dead on what I need and what you need. And every time the Spirit of God comes before that throne of the Father on my and your behalf and prays for us, it's exactly what you need at that moment in time to help you to be more like Jesus Christ. And I would say if we knew what some of those prayers were, we would say, wait, no, don't pray that. That's what I think. I think that if we really knew those words, they're groanings which cannot be uttered, right? And I think sometimes we'd say, no, don't pray that, because that doesn't seem like that's going to help me. But the Holy Spirit's saying, look, what I'm praying for you is to help you be like the Lord Jesus. Let me pray it. And the Father, verse 27, knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Search, he searcheth the hearts, what is the mind of the Spirit, and He makes intercession according to the will of God. Praise God. He prays for us. And then lastly, in that same vein, is Jude. The book of Jude. All right, any chapter will do. In the book of Jude, we'll just grab verse 20. You choose the chapter. I'll pick it up in verse 19. Do you remember, as you're turning there, do you remember what Jude's talking about? He said, man, I really wanted to write to you about this, but I got I to gotta write to you about earnestly contending for the faith because there's so many false prophets and there's all these people out there trying to jerk you off the path of following Jesus Christ and they're introducing bad doctrine to the church and they're, they're just causing people to live uh, immoral lives and so on. He says, you just, you're going to have to call them out. And he goes through just the verses before this and he says, they're ungodly this, ungodly that, ungodly this, ungodly that. And so he gets to the end of that. He talks about at the very end of verse number 18, and they walk after their own ungodly lusts. Verse 19, These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, watch, there's three things here. Building up yourselves on the most holy faith. Build. Second, praying. Praying in the Holy Ghost. The third thing results from the first two. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Building yourself. You know, there, are, there is an obligation put on us as believers to help. Uh, that's not, I don't want to say the word help. Enabling God to make us what we ought to be. He is not going to transform you and I into the Christians that we should be while we are just getting lazy. He said, you're going to have to build yourself up. You're going to have to do some construction on your own. But you build yourself up in the most holy faith so that you don't become part of that group he's talking about before that are just ungodly. Build yourself up in the most holy faith and the second thing is here with relation to the Holy Spirit, praying in the Holy Spirit. Well, this ties in again to similar what we just said there about the Spirit of God praying for us. We've talked about this before. If I'm going to pray in the Spirit, I have to be able to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. I've got to know what the mind of the Holy Spirit is. I've got to be walking lockstep with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I can't just pray as I feel like or what my opinion might be. I've got to get the mind of the Lord. And I get that mind in part through the Spirit of God. And he says, I want you then to be praying in the Spirit of God. And unless we're doing that, we don't get to claim verse 21 keeping ourselves. You guys with me tonight? They go together. I'm building and I'm praying. 
But I'm not just praying how I feel. I'm praying according to the will of the Spirit of God. And when I do that, then I can keep myself in the love of God. Remember what I said about this last week. You don't make God love you more or less based on what you do. That's not how the love of God works. But I do get to live in the love of God more or less based on how I'm behaving. I'm going to live like a rebel. I'm removing myself from the blessings of the love of God. He wants us to be building and praying so that we can keep ourselves in the place where we're getting that constant outflow of the blessings of the love of God in our life. Keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And with regard to prayer, as I've said before, and I'm going to finish with this. Maybe this isn't true about you. I'll say it about me, and if it, it's true about you, then you can sign on as well. I've prayed a lot of prayers that I did not know that that was the mind of the Spirit of God when I prayed it. And there's been, by the mercy of God, a lot of times He ignored that. But it's not always to my benefit you know, it's not always going to work out that way. If I will pray the way the Spirit of God leads me to pray, as I'm building myself, I get to stay in the love of God. I keep myself there. But we have got to learn to pray. I'll say it again. I have got to learn to pray better knowing the mind of the Spirit of, Christ, of, of God, the Spirit of Christ. I have to. I cannot, I can't make a habit of getting on my knees and rattling off a prayer list that while I'm saying what's on my list, my mind is over here. That's not praying in the Spirit. Any more than I can drive down Crawford Street up the footpath. I'm not really driving down Crawford Street. I can't claim to be praying if I'm not going to be praying in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God wants to control us in our prayer time just as much as He does any other time in our life. And uh, I, for one, uh, I find it shameful the amount of times in my life that I've just prayed through something and all I'm doing is mouthing words. So guys, I, I want to exhort us with that tonight. The Spirit, one of the works of the Spirit of God is helping us in prayer. So let's help Him by walking in the Spirit and praying in the Spirit. Is that okay? Yeah. You guys all right tonight? Maybe a tired bunch, I guess. That's enough for tonight. We'll go ahead and stop there and pick it up next time. The Lord willing. Father, thank you again for the teaching of the Spirit of God through the Scriptures. Uh, we recognize that the Scriptures were given by inspiration of God, that the Holy Spirit was uh, very much the one who uh, moved men of God who spake and wrote exactly what the Spirit would have them to say. And in doing all that, God, you recorded these truths for us tonight. And I pray that, uh, again, we would become much, much more aware of the truths of the Holy Spirit and yielded to the Holy Spirit so it's not just an academic knowledge but that it's a true Christian character of that, that, that we have, a Christian character of our life to be filled with the Spirit of God, led by the Spirit of God, and governed by and, and walking in that Spirit. Lord, help us, we pray. I pray that you'll take us home safely tonight. You'll guard us, bring us all back again safely on this coming Sunday meeting time. Lord, uh, bless those that are going back out into the work world and being defiled by the world. Would you help them to just be steadfast, have the joy of the Lord, and to be a good witness. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, then. We're dismissed. Good night.